The way I look at it, if you allow a goal six minutes and 24 seconds into a game, then coming back to tie it shortly thereafter is more like gaining a point rather than losing two. So as far as Aston Villa's start is concerned, excuse me, there's a B in here. You'll find as you get older that Bs irritate you more and more. So four points out of a possible nine to start the season. Not great, certainly not terrible, not spectacular. But given the never-ending disruptions to this squad, not surprising either. So for today's show, I'm pouring an old Pulteney 12. This is a good whiskey. It's not spectacular like the 21 or the 17, but... You know, if your first choice whiskey and your second choice whiskey and your third choice whiskey are not available due to isolation or injury, well, then this one will do the trick. So pour yourself a glass and let's dissect Aston Villa 1, Brentford 1. Welcome back inside the Villa Parlor. And I have to say, I actually really quite enjoyed this game. It's two progressive clubs that have new ideas, obviously lots of connections between them. I respect the Bees and their rather brilliant owner. In fact, they're probably the best thing to come out of Brentford since this mob. But after Aston Villa fell behind, I was very encouraged by the fact they went after it and responded so quickly. And if we're being really honest, after that, the best chances to go on and win the game did fall to Aston Villa. So here we go with the Holy Trinity, the three big moments or issues that defined Aston Villa won and Brentford won. And I'm going to start with an honorable mention, and I have three of them, and that is the continuous disruption to this squad. Have you ever remembered a more disjointed or disrupted preseason leading into the beginning of the season than this one? I mean, you had two teams in preseason that had to cancel because of COVID. And then you had the captain up and leaving and then injuries. Ollie Watkins hasn't been injured in three years. And of course, he's injured in that final tune-up along with Bertrand Traore. Then you had Leon Bailey, who wasn't quite right. Morgan Sanson still hasn't come back yet. And then you had Tyrone Mings, who cracked a rib. He sold on last week against Newcastle, but you could see the taping under his jersey and it was just too much for him this week. And then on the eve of what you'd call a very winnable game, you have John McGinn and Jacob Ramsey ruled out because of COVID or isolation or whatever it may be. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm looking forward to the calendar turning from August to September to hopefully get some continuity back and to get a settled side finally together. Honorable mention number two is just Villa's shape defensively and their resoluteness from open play. The goal on Saturday came from the second phase of a set piece, but beyond Rico Henry's chance in the 33rd minute where he dragged it just wide and Callum Wilson last week on the early breakaway, can you remember in these last two weeks Villa looking breached or Emmy Martinez being tested for that matter? And that's a good thing because Villa have had to use four center backs over the last two weeks and they've had to rotate their side. So there is this defensive mindset that is built in and it looks pretty structured and strong, which is good news because when all these attack-minded players come back, Villa will have a platform to work from. And I think Dean Smith wants a team that's excellent in transition and on the break. And you need to have a good foundation defensively in open play to do that. And Villa will be tested defensively from open play in September. And honorable mention number one is Ollie Watkins' return. And I honestly feel like Ollie Watkins is underappreciated or undervalued by our own supporters because so many people put such a premium on the goal output and the goal output alone. But Ollie Watkins does a couple of things so incredibly well. One of them is he reels the ball in and then maintains possession. He gets his body between the defender and the ball and he's so miserably awful to try to 
to knock off of it. I would hate to play against Ollie Watkins as a defender. And then the other thing is the work rate, which is incredible. He's not blindingly quick, but he's not slow. He's relentless. And that's why he's such a good pressing forward, because he directs traffic in which way he wants the ball to go. And since coming on, he managed to get two shots on target against his old team, drawing saves both time. Now, I think if he had more match time and match fitness, the one that El Ghazi switched across to him instead of trying to go for goal on the header, he would have probably tried going back across to Ings. But still, he drew two saves since coming on. And we got a tiny little glimpse of what a Watkins-Ings partnership might look like at the very late stages where they broke away in stoppage time. And I think when those two were on the same page, good things are going to happen. Number three, second phase failure. And by the way, I know Aston Villa's set piece coach is named Austin McPhee. But I had this really weird Tony Adams moment last week. And for some reason, I called him Austin McGee and then just ran with it and stayed with it all the way through the show. So now I have this total Scottish dyslexia thing going on. McPhee, McGee, Austin, Angus. I'm going to call him Angus McGee at some point. It's flummoxed my brain and crosswired it so much that whenever I see his face now, I piss myself. And I'm glad you find that amusing because it's really hard to watch a game because they pan down to the bench so much. Talk about old P. You know, so I think I'm just going to call him Angus McGee from here on in. And it'll be our little joke. Besides, I think it kind of suits him. And that's the most Scottish name since Hamish McGregor. When the lineups were released, I saw a lot of comments on social media from people saying that this was actually a better lineup than the one against Newcastle because there is this anti-Mings agenda, it seems. And there are even McGinn detractors among us. But let's be honest, if Mings and McGinn and Jacob Ramsey were available, they would have started this game to maintain some continuity because there would have been 10 out of 11 starting from the team that played against Newcastle, just Ashley Young and Matt Target notwithstanding there. Meanwhile, Brentford is one of the most settled sides in the league and they have been since last year and Thomas Frank just does not make changes because he wants players to be comfortable with one another and when they are they know their roles and responsibilities and their systems and that is what is so important in set piece routines particularly in defending them there were a few things that Aston Villa could have probably done better on that corner just six minutes and 20 seconds into the first half the ball goes out to the other side of the penalty area, Douglas Louise races across, but instead of holding the ball there, it's played basically right through him. Then Pontus Janssen leans into Ezri Konza, outmuscles him, and flicks the ball around the corner beautifully into the very area that Tyrone Mings would have probably been occupying. Instead, it was cash and target, and neither of them deal with arguably the best poacher on the field next to Danny Ings, who's allowed to sweep the ball home into the top corner. Corner. It's never just one little mistake that leads to a goal. It's a combination, a cumulative effect, a series of mishaps. And that's exactly what happened here. Three mishaps. The one thing you could say about Tyrone Mings, though, is that usually he's pretty good with seeing the danger. Sometimes it's about not dealing with the danger for the captain. But a lot of people were saying, oh, here's Konza and Tuan Zebi, a dream center bag partnership. But when you don't get to play a lot together, this is exactly where breakdowns occur. You need the time together, the continuity together, and the training time to work on these very situations. Number two, cash makes a money run. See that cash makes a money run. See what I did there? I'm still not 100% certain that Matt Cash is a long-term bona fide starting right back in the Premier League. He does things very well, including he's quick, he's brave, decent at a tackle, lots of energy. What he will have worked on in the offseason is more progressive dribbles, more progressive passing, and also better crossing accuracy into the box. But the one thing that he certainly has taken on board and has employed right through the preseason and now is joining the attack when it's on. And I have to say that Matt Target is also starting to look a little bit more like the Matt Target of last year because it was his beautiful 
60-yard ball into the path of Danny Ings down the left wing that led to the 1-1 goal. And by the way, Target took a difficult ball for Martinez, brought it down, and then swerved it beautifully into the path of Ings. And that wasn't the only time that he played a ball like that into Ings in this game. From that point, Ings keeps possession, combines with El Ghazi to get it back and plays a lovely little ball right to the top of the area for Buendia. And I don't know if he did it on purpose or not, but he pivoted with his back to goal. And in that split second, that was the cue for Matt Cash to bomb forward. And as he did, he drew the attention of center back Ethan Pinnock and the left sided player Rico Henry over just for that split moment. And so Buendia turns and he sees that it's on and he buries it. And in Dean Smith's system, fullback support is really important. You have to be able to overload on both sides to keep teams guessing. And this was a perfect example of that. And for Andy Buendia, another glimpse into what will be with this player, because he's still not razor sharp. His touch isn't perfect just yet. His weight of pass isn't that great and spot on just yet. And he seems to be caught sometimes in this decision. Do I dribble past a player or do I play it and get it back? Because he gets out muscled a lot. He's not the biggest guy on the field, but what a finish, what a moment. And I think everybody can see we've got a player here who's just going to keep getting better. And the number one big moment or issue from Villa one, Brentford one, Reyes reaction stop on Danny Ings. We saw Ings' role in the goal, a lovely ball to Emi Buendia after a nice little combination with Anwar El Ghazi. And this is part of Danny Ings' game that is so underrated and why I'm so eager to see him play some meaningful minutes with Ollie Watkins to see those two combine together. But Danny Ings' talent, his gift is his instinct of knowing exactly where the ball is going to be and then arriving there on time. And this is exactly what happened on this play. And it must be said that it started with Matt Cash recycling a ball, second phase from a set piece, floats a beautiful switch out to Anwar El Ghazi. And then it looks like Aston Villa's set piece coach is trying to target one of the center backs to head the ball back across into Danny Ings' wheelhouse. And that's exactly what happened here. Konza stays up and in the action. The ball's played in. He heads it down and Ings, boom, never wastes a second. It's on target. It's good contact. And Rea had very little time to react, but he got down and he made the save. And it was a big save. You know, imagine at that stage that goes in, that would have been like an uppercut straight to the button because Brentford scores. Villa replies just six minutes later, and then it was just six minutes after Buendia's goal that this chance came around. And if Ings had put it in the top corner or had buried that one, then Brentford would have been staggering aimlessly around the ring. Not to mention that I think that that would have played into what Aston Villa really wants to be, which is the team that takes the lead and then forces their opponent to take more initiatives, take more risk, commit men forward, and then catch them on the counter, which is precisely why they've brought in players like Buendia to set up players like Leon Bailey. And one final note, we saw the first Premier League start for 17-year-old Carney Chukwameka. Everybody must have their first ever start at the top level, and we got to watch it here, and let's hope it's the first of many in a fruitful Aston Villa career for Chuck number two, the younger of the Chuck Wameka brothers. And I see a lot of comments on social media about he's ready, he should be starting, he's going to take games over. Well, we saw in this game that there is a huge difference between fourth tier Barrow, with all due respect, and a Premier League opponent. He was very conservative, very peripheral in his actions, especially going forward. And I respect the fact that there was a maturity about how he went about things to make sure he wasn't caught out of position and that he erred on the side of not getting caught having to chase back. That's a very positive and encouraging sign. But this kid needs a lot of growth, refinement, and a lot of minutes. And we need to calm down on the kids. 
because some of the things you see are make believe fantasy football fifa 21 that's what it is it's not real world and unfortunately what everybody needs when they're young is patience and there just isn't a whole lot of patience around in modern day football it's all about now instant gratification we need to win today Time to tabulate the points and some of these subcategories we'll be following throughout the season as three games are officially in the books, including two at Villa Park, where Villa have earned four points. Villa's set piece coach, I think, will have to take a one allowed. I know it was a second phase, but it was pretty close to the corner being taken. And I think with all due respect to Brentford, we have to call them a bottom six side at this point because they were one of the promoted teams. Now, last week, we were so excited because the plane departed from the gate. It was taxiing towards the runway on its European flight path. But unfortunately, uh, a passenger had has fallen ill and so that passenger is receiving medical treatment and they're just delaying the takeoff at this point well i never thought i'd say this but bring on the international break and hopefully a respite for the players a chance to get fit healthy and come back from injury or get the fitness that they need and hopefully for those players going away on international duty they come back unscathed although the argentines are going to have to isolate and that just makes me wonder whether johan lange is going to be working the phones right up till the window closing to see if he could find a backup goalkeeping option we shall see because the next game of course is against Chelsea at the bridge and Aston Villa pulled four out of six points against the Blues last year. Still a very tough challenge. Until then, be well and up the mighty Villa.